look, I'm getting these really funny heartbeats. Oh, that's anxiety. Other aspects of lifestyle which may be relevant. Be patient with yourself and just build up gradually. So I just needed to have them work with me. There's a whole bunch of cardiomyopathies. Benefits of doing genetic testing. Take their own heart monitor. There's better types of fat. Try and find a cure for inherited heart muscle diseases. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, ooh, that's quite loud. Okay. <clears throat> it's really nice to be here with you all uh, and really nice to be um, working with this uh, uh, fantastic charity. Um, so, yeah, as was introduced, I'm actually wearing two hats today. I'm going to give two sort of short talks of 10 minutes each. Uh, one is about uh, this project, The Cure Heart, and the other is about The Heart Hive. And uh, I'm happy to uh, talk about either of those afterwards. So, firstly, Cure Heart. Uh, what is it? What does it mean? So uh, you may or may not have seen about five years ago now, just it was you know, in another era, before the end of the world, um, the British Heart Foundation decided uh, to do something really transformative. They decided they wanted to make a sort of a mega grant. Now most research grants are of the order of sort of 250, 300,000 pounds would be a sort of small project grant. Uh, a sort of low number of millions would run a small team for for um, five years, perhaps, for a bigger project. And they said, no, we, we, want, we want to make to do something big. We're going to put up 30 million pounds to do something really transformative. What is the biggest challenge in heart disease at the moment? And teams from all around the world said, you know, what they thought the biggest challenge was and uh, where, you know, where they thought the money should go. Should it go to coronary disease? Should it go to um, deal with aortic aneurysm? Should it go to, uh, you know, where should it go? And um, fortunately for everyone in this room, um, the successful uh, bid was Cure Heart. Um, and um, this is led by uh, Hugh Watkins, uh, who works in Oxford, um, pulled together the team. Um, the team comprises uh, people from all around the world. His sort of co-lead uh, is um, a Cricket Sideman, who works in Boston. And crucially, in partnership with Cardiomyopathy the UK, who were you know, part of making the case and saying why this is something really important. And um, so Cure Heart is uh, the project uh, that the British Heart Foundation have funded to, as the name suggests, try and find a cure for inherited heart muscle diseases uh, over the next fight. The grant is for about five to seven years. That's the kind of um, time window that they need, to, uh, and we will hope we will make transformative progress. So um, the real opportunity, I think, is that there are some emerging tools to interact with our genomes that were simply not there five, ten years ago. And uh, we think that now, if we push in the right places, uh, we can potentially uh, get some of those tools available uh, for this community, uh, both to treat, cure card um, cardiomyopathies, and also potentially to prevent cardiomyopathies. So uh, there have been lots of talks today. I don't know who's been in which sessions, uh, but uh, I imagine uh, most, if not all of you, know that DNA codes for proteins. Proteins are the, the doers in our bodies. They, they, uh, different cells express different proteins, and that's what determines their identity. And changes in the DNA change the structure of proteins, and they can uh, uh, interfere with the function of our cells, including in the heart. And so many cardiomyopathies are due to a sort of single letter change in our DNA that then cascades down to either not making enough protein, making an abnormal protein that doesn't work, making an overactive protein or a protein that does something that it shouldn't. And uh, the hope is, and I think this is more than hope, is that we now have a toolkit that we can use to turn off a gene if it's doing something it shouldn't, uh, turn on a gene that's not working, replace uh, a faulty gene copy if it's broken, or, 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 or repair it in situ. That sounds kind of fancy. Does it, you know, on what basis am I making any of those claims? Well, actually, the, the first thing to say is that um, 
there are tools for editing our genome in editing genomes actually in nature. They, they, they exist. Bacteria express these proteins called, um, uh, exp express a system called the CRISPR-Cas9 system, which chops up DNA in a very, very precise way. So it can, they can recognize viruses that are attacking bacteria and just chop up the virus's DNA without chopping their own. And some of the CureHeart team are amongst the people who kind of recognize that and thought we can repurpose this system and sort of retrain it to chop up bits of DNA we want to chop up instead. And so this has been around for a while. Uh, we can very precisely cut the genome in specific places, and you can use that to some extent to repair uh, the genome. And this um, newspaper article is, um, I think, about five years old now, but it was the first time that this technique had been used in a human embryo. It was not done with a, 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 you know, a plan to create a child. This was a, a embryonic stem cells um, <clears throat> that were, were sort of donated for research and obviously and, and not allowed to develop, uh, not put in an environment where they could develop into a human. But nonetheless, they were human cells that carried a genetic um, mutation. The, the cells that they worked on were actually uh, from someone with cardiomyopathy. And so this was a, an HCM causing uh, mutation in MYBPC3 that was successfully edited, <clears throat> and obviously, as I said, the, the, uh, there was, was never any plan that this would then be implanted back into a person and allowed to grow, uh, because that introduces lots of other ethical questions, but technically, it can be done. If, of course, you have access to an embryo in a dish, which is all very well, but what if you've got cardiomyopathy and you're an adult and, uh, and it's affecting your heart? Well, those are some of the, the challenges. So what we now need to think uh, through, and what CureHeart is doing, is how do you do this fundamental maneuver of silencing, repairing, replacing faulty DNA without interfering with any other DNA at the same time? And I think we have the tools, but we need to prove that they work. How do you get all that stuff into the heart? Yes, you can do it in a Petri dish, but can you get the, the repair kit where it needs to be? If you can do all that, actually, who, who's going to benefit? Should we give it to, should we be doing this in people who've got established cardiomyopathy? Will it actually cause the disease to regress, or do we need to treat people before they develop cardiomyopathy? And obviously there you're, you know, we'd, we'd be working with healthy people who don't have any problem with heart and exposing them to some experimental treatment. So what, you know, what's the best um, strategy? And how do we prove that it works? Because again, if we give it to healthy people before they develop cardiomyopathy, how can we sh then show that it's, that it's done good? It takes time to prove that they're not getting a disease they don't have. <coughs> Excuse me. So those are the challenges that Cure Heart is trying to address. <coughs> and the team covers several bits of this pathway. So there are some people who are, who are really into the genetics of cardiomyopathy, trying to figure out what are the genes what are, that need to be repaired, who are the, the patients who are going to benefit, how do we design studies. Um, and I'm working as part of that team. Um, there are a team who are doing the very technical bit of how do you engineer DNA? They're, most of those people are in America, some of them in the UK. And then one of the big questions is how do you get this stuff to the heart? Um, and the, the answer is usually in a virus. So there are some viruses that are harmless to our health but have a um, predilection to head, out, head to the heart and infect heart cells. And so if you load your editing machinery in them, they'll go and find the heart for you, they'll get into heart cells, and they'll deliver your editing uh, equipment. So that's what we usually do. The virus is called um, AAV9, is the commonest adeno-associated virus 9. Um, but there are some other strategies. You can make things that look like viruses, but that aren't. They're just sort of harmless um, sort of particles that float around the body and then uh, and try and make them target the heart. So there are a few, a few strategies that are being worked on. Um, where are we in this journey? Well, we can, the, all, all, all of these steps have been done to some greater or lesser extent. Um, so, turning off a faulty gene, one way you can do this is when uh, the cell makes, uh, 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 on the pathway to making uh, protein out of DNA, we, it, the cells create a molecule called RNA, which is the sort of intermediary. And um, RNA is normally a single strand of RNA. Uh, Viruses can also create RNA, but when they do that, they're often double-stranded. And so our cells have mechanisms to eat, destroy, double-stranded RNA. And so if you put in an RNA uh, into a cell that matches the, a faulty gene, they will bind each other, 
create a double-stranded RNA, it looks like an invading virus and our cells destroy it. That's uh, maybe a little complicated, but um, the, the idea is that we can very precisely turn off um, uh, particular genes, and this has been done um, a few, 10 years ago now in mice with HCM, and you can see here um, a, an image of a heart from a control mouse is a mouse that didn't get any treatment, and you can see, uh, I hope, some sort of blue scarring in the heart, and you can see some disarray of the cells. So that's what uh, a mouse with cardiomyopathy looks like. And on the right, you can see very little scarring and um, nicely organized heart muscle cells. So these were mice that were treated successfully by turning off a faulty gene. Um, just this year, this paper emerged again. It, um, unfortunate poor mice with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, uh, treated in a, a different strategy where instead of just turning off a faulty copy of the gene, they put in the equipment to edit a single letter that was creating a false, faulty um, 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 myosin protein. And again, you can see very similar things. There's none of this blue scarring. The heart looks sort of clean and nicely organized. So again, a successful, very precise cure. And there's a trial running at the moment of replacing a faulty gene. So if you don't uh, have, a, if you have a faulty copy of MYBPC3, uh, this study, and I saw some flyers outside for Tanaya who are running this, um, has just dosed its first patient last month with uh, a gene replacement. So there you have a whole new copy of the gene inside a virus goes to the heart and basically replaces the the faulty gene copy. So I think that is 10 minutes. Um, that is the vision. That's what Cure Heart is doing. Um, and uh, some of the Cure Heart team you will have seen have got to stand outside, and I'll be around, and many of them will be around. So um, come and talk to anyone if, uh, if this vision of the future is exciting. So uh, that's part one. I now feel I need to take a little breath. Um, <laughs> part two is to talk about the heart hive. So, um, in a nutshell, the Heart Hive is um, a web portal that aims to connect people who want to participate in research with people who are doing research. It's as simple as that, and it is available uh, to all of you. This came around because we were having a sort of a patient engagement event. We were with Joel and the Cardiomyopathy UK team uh, in a sort of round table chatting about people's experiences, and, uh, and patients were just saying to us, well, this is all very well, but I live wherever, and um, there's no research happening here or at my hospital. How do I actually take part? Um, and uh, um, Cardiomyopathy UK were, were you know, very proactive about research and think uh, that, it, that it's obviously it's needed for the community, but also for individuals that many people say it's helpful, that being able to do something proactive about your condition, to engage in the process of trying to make the world a better place, as it were, um, you know, feels good and is good, and um, so we wanted to try and uh, help people to participate in research and also to design research and to shape what research is done, not just to get involved in you know, what scientists think is important. From the other perspective, from sort of my perspective as someone who does research, um, it can be difficult to find people to take part in studies, um, particularly when you get into a rare condition. So let's say we want to trial a therapy of a particular, targeting one particular gene, which let's say affects 1% of people with dilated cardiomyopathy. So in a clinic, we might have a few hundred or a thousand people, but let's say only half of, the, half of those have one type of cardiomyopathy, and then that ends up with being a, a small handful of people with a particular uh, genetic uh, variant that we think this therapy might be helpful for. So we need to find a way to connect bigger communities and to work together. And also, it's quite time uh, resource intensive to sort of track people down around all over the country. So actually having uh, a system where you can enter data directly and where we can link up to national records and things is very helpful. And as I said, we want to know what are the actual priorities that, that um, people with cardiomyopathy want to address. So the Heart Hive aims to bridge that gap. Um, it's quite simple. It's a website. Um, uh, it should work on your phone or whatever, as well as uh, a computer. It takes about a minute just to create an account, so very quick to register. Um, and then uh, it takes a little bit longer, but not too long, 10, 20 minutes, to just fill in some baseline information about you. And that is just, you know, what sort of cardiomyopathy you have, if you've had genetic testing and happen to know the result, a few bits and pieces. 
that then let us match you to research opportunities. So we can find a researcher interested in dilated cardiomyopathy rather than hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or you know, variants in MYBPC3 versus M variants in MYH7 or whatever it might be. And we can do some of the kind of matching to different study eligibility things. And then uh, you're presented with a menu of studies, and you might just say, actually, no thanks, not interested in any of that. But if you see a study that you think is interesting, uh, you can kind of vote with your feet, as it were, and say, well, that's the one I'm going to support with my participation and my data. And, and the other thing that it does is actually stores your data for you so that you can fill in, let's say, questionnaires about how you've been doing once a year. And then if a new study appears that you think is useful, you can give them all the data that you correct, collected for you know, some previous study. So actually, it puts you in charge. It's your data. It's your information. You can give it to whichever researchers uh, are doing work that you think uh, is helpful. Um, so this is uh, what it looks like. Um, there are uh, uh, several hundred participants already, and we've run something like uh, half a dozen studies maybe through, through the platform. Some of them... Uh, all the work is done online. Some of them it's really, as I said, just a matching program and then the research is done in a particular institution uh, if you can reach there. Um, I'll tell you, I think, I, yes, I've just got a little bit of time to tell you about some of those studies briefly. The first uh, was simply called the Heart Hive Cardiomyopathy Study. I don't know if there's anyone here who's participated in this. But this was really just to convince everyone that this, this works because it's all very well as an idea. But, um, uh, you know, a funder might say to us, well, how do you know these people really have cardiomyopathy and are they this, uh, you know, is it the same pattern as you would get when you're recruiting people in a hospital, these sorts of questions. So we just did something quite simple to prove uh, that it works. We, we gathered, did exactly what I just described, gathered information over the web, posted out saliva kits so that we could get a, a you spit in a tube and we can get a sample of your uh, DNA and then sent out some annual surveys. And um, uh, this was done um, three years ago now, I suppose, and we had um, a, a couple of hundred people took part. Most of those people had never taken part in a research study, which was fantastic for us. Uh, we had people from all around the country, as you can see on the map, unlike if we were running this uh, at our centre in southwest London. And um, it was a, a really engaged population of people. So we, uh, sometimes it can be difficult to stay in touch with people over years if you meet them once in the hospital when they come for a, a scan or something. And then, you know, pe people have got, got busy lives. It can be, you know, you may or may not be able to stay in contact. So from, uh, it, things worked very well. Um, another study that we did was during the pandemic. We launched this not long before the pandemic. And, of course, it was, uh, you know, f first that raised a lot of questions around what should people with cardiomyopathy be doing? Should, you be, should we be shielding? Should we be, what advice should we be giving people? What are the risks? Um, and it was very difficult to carry out research because no one was coming to hospitals. Um, so actually this worked very, very well in, in being able to continue to carry out research and on new and important questions uh, during the pandemic. What we found, for example, is actually COVID wasn't causing, wasn't affecting people with cardiomyopathy particularly badly, um, but not being able to get to cardiomyopathy care was. And so that, I think, was, was, was very useful information. And you could see on, on the right of this some of the disruption uh, that people were reporting to, to their cardiomyopathy care was clearly um, challenging. Another little study I wanted to tell you about, um, Brian Halliday was speaking earlier, and some of you may have uh, seen him. He was uh, trying to, was uh, writing a grant. One of the things that he studies is um, if, you've, if you look like you're recovering from cardiomyopathy or you have recovered, particularly with dilated cardiomyopathy, you know, do you have to keep taking medications lifelong or not? We didn't really know the answer to that. People are quite scared to stop medications. Doctors are quite scared to stop patients' medications. Some patients are quite scared to stop their medications. Others are desperate to get rid of them. So we wanted to figure out, well, actually, you know, what do you want to do? Do you, would, do you want to try stopping them? Is there any point running a study to explore that? You know, and so we had a sort of co-design process. It was really helpful. And having that patient insight was you know, re really enabling in then persuading the British Heart Foundation to give, give some money to do the research, which is now um, going on. So, so that was thanks to, to, to you guys for helping us design the study that needed to be done, proving that it needed to be done, giving us the data to convince the funders that this was something important. So, yeah, that's just inside 20 minutes. That's um, all I wanted to say for now. We have the platform is there. Now, some of you may have registered in the past um, we were up and running for a little while, and then our platform provider 
decided they weren't going to operate in Europe anymore and left us a little bit in the lurch. So for the last few months, we've been a little bit in limbo, uh, but um, we've just moved, had a new platform. It's up and running. It works today. So if you are, well, it started working again on Thursday. So um, if you haven't signed up already, you can now sign up again, uh, and we will we'll be running as usual. If you had signed up before, your data hasn't been moved over yet, and so uh, you will still be in a limbo just for a few more weeks until we get that sorted. And at the moment, there aren't lots and lots of studies to sign up for because we're having to sort of, uh, as I said, set up shop um, again. Um, uh, so thank you very much. If you're at all interested, do come and talk to us. Do sign up. Um, you can point your phone at that and do it. We've got some little cards and information out on the desk outside. Uh, and we're uh, you know, in, uh, visible on various social media platforms, if any of those uh, things are of interest to you. But fund fundamentally, this is you know, for the cardiomyopathy community. And if there's anything we should be doing differently, uh, better, um, you've got ideas, then uh, you know, this is, uh, is yours, not mine. And do, do come and share your thoughts and ideas. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to take any questions. <coughs> any questions for James? Yes, one. And also you can see him and his team just outside, on the right-hand side. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just a quick question about the geography. If, um, so the advantage is you get people from all over the country. Can you also separate the data so that you can see regional variations in whatever you're studying with the heart hive one? Um, yes, you can. Well, essentially, again, that's, that's up to you. Um, uh, so... Um, uh, when you provide the data, we're not using it. It's just there. And then a researcher has to sort of have a valid question, and you have to say, yes, you can use my data to ask that question. And so if you're happy for them to uh, ask a question about regionality, then, then yes. So we, we absolutely, that data is there. You know, you, we don't share people's names and addresses. Everything is anonymized for use. Um, but uh, if they want access to a postcode in order to ask that question or to a city or whatever, and you're happy for them to have that data, then yes. And so I think that is important, the sort of regional um, inequalities uh, um, around health, uh, air quality. There's lots of, lots, of, lots of things we can explore. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. It's really lovely to be here today. My name's Gemma. I'm one of the cardiac research nurses at Barts Hospital. This is my colleague, Floor. She's one of the senior research nurses, and she leads the cardio myopathy trials. Um, we are just here to talk about our current cardiomyopathy research. I know Professor Elliot mentioned before that we've got many more trials than we've ever had um, before, really. Um, the benefits of taking part in research and what you might need to consider because every trial is so different, um, and then how to take part and how to find out a little bit more about the trials. So just a little bit about BARTS. Um, it's, we're very proud to be the oldest hospital in Great Britain. It celebrated its 900th, um, oh, it came on like that, birthday this year. Uh, we're part of BARTS Health NHS Trust, so we're based in East London. Um, and the BARTS Heart Centre, as we're known, is Europe's largest specialised cardiovascular centre, and it's based at the St Bartholomew site, which is near St Paul's Cathedral. So in terms of our research teams, um, we uh, cover trials in all areas of cardiovascular care, so uh, cardiac devices and arrhythmia, but we're here today to talk about our um, inherited cardiac conditions trial covering um, all cardiomyopathy. We've got several active trials at the moment. Um, our research is delivered by a multidisciplinary team. Um, so you'll see clinical staff, you'll see specialised research nurses. There's also research specific roles. I came from a clinical cardiac role into research. It really is a whole new world, clinical research. So we have data managers, clinical trial practitioners. There'll also be allied health professionals involved, particularly around doing your imaging, who are trained on specific research protocols, and obviously our research pharmacy as well. Um, Flo's just going to go through now some of the actively recruiting trials. So um, we have a couple of, well, we have 
about 10 um, ongoing trials at the moment at Bart's Heart Centre, and these are some of the few important ones. So um, we do commercial, non-commercial trials, a mixture of both. Um, and these trials currently address conditions for patients with obstructive, non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and dilated cardiomyopathy. As um, was mentioned previously in the other sessions, we focus now on drug trials. Um, they're commercial drug trials looking at the cardiac myosin inhibitor safety and effectiveness. And these drugs, as you can see, could be um, you have Mavacamptin, and then there's another one, Afikamptin. Um, and we also have observational trials, which are precursor to gene therapy trials, which we are hoping to um, start um, recruiting or screening mid-2024 or later um, in the year of 2024. Um, and as Professor Elliot mentioned in his session earlier, we've got a lot of um, cardiomyopathy trials that we're looking forward to set up and run at Bart's Heart Center. And one of them is, um, is the Afikamton trial. Um, this is another type of the cardiac myosin inhibitor which targets patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and we are currently screening for these patients. So um, if you have this type of condition and if you're interested to go through the screening process, we have our booth outside. You can um, speak to one of us and we'll be um, happy to talk you through about it. Um, secondly, we are also at the early phase of um, uh, planning with our gene therapy suite as we are expecting a couple of gene therapy trials that might um, come about in mid-2024 um, and this would be pivotal for the cardiomyopathy patient care in the future and obviously the recent one that we have is the Mavacamptin which is now approved by um, the national guidelines so um, uh, currently I think these are being offered amongst the specialist cardiac center. There is a specific criteria for this, so um, I wouldn't delve much deeper on that because I think most um, it was mentioned earlier. Um, uh, yeah, so that's one of the trials that we did a couple of years ago, about three years ago. It all started with the double blind placebo variant. You um, trial the actual drug to a placebo, and then these patients get the chance to be offered, offered the actual drug in the open label um, or the extension uh, of this trial. Um, then obviously, uh, taking part in these clinical trials, we have um, pros and cons. Um, so I'm going to go through more on the benefits of it. And one of those is access to um, innovative treatments um, that may not be available through standard of care. Um, some of the clinical trials also offer personalized, personalized treatment approaches, such as the gene therapy. So that's something that we can all look forward to. And obviously, as you take part in these clinical trials, and most of these drug trials are quite new, therefore, we, um, we do close monitoring and care for, um, for all of these patients who are in a research trial. So you will be attending clinic visits, you will be seen by the clinical research team and the respective um, clinician that is assigned to that uh, particular study. So you, at, um, uh, you will be an expert of your own um, condition and you will be able to contribute to the medical knowledge in the community. And that's something that we are, um, proud of and empowered to um, promote amongst our cardiomyopathy patients, especially the ones we have at BART. Um, pro, um, cons wise, we obviously there is a huge commitment taking part in these trials in a sense that there is a rigid um, time point with the follow-ups. You will be required to come to the site for um, clinic visits. You will go through a couple of tests, which Gemma will go through later on, how it is um, to take part in a research um, at BART. Um, but it's up to you whether you will be up for it. You will 
you are committed to go through this process. Obviously, we'll be here to support you, those patients we have who have been taking part in these clinical trials. Um, we are normally uh, their source or, or their point of contact, and we normally work with the the clinical nurse specialist um, and the consultants closely. So we will be, uh, you will have an extra person basically to, to ask for help if you need to. Um, and obviously um, representation is an important part of clinical trials to ensure the results represents patients in different walks of life. Um, so Bart's Heart Center is, a, is at the forefront of maintaining this um, um, inclusion and diversity through um, improving our clinical trial practices, offering patients in different you know, cultural backgrounds um, abilities to have equal access to, to the trials. And before I go to that, so with all of these trials going on, if there is something that you would be interested at, or if you think that you know you could uh, you could potentially be part of this trial, please do uh, speak to your um, local clinician or local healthcare provider first um, that you would you are keen or you would be <coughs> happy to to take part in this trial if you are not under BART's health um, NHS trust. And they can link you to us, they can do send necessary referrals for, and then we'll take that um, forward. For now, Gemma will talk you through how it is to be a research patient at BART's Heart Center. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so as Phil said, if you're asked to take part in research because you've expressed interest um, or you've been approached, you'd be given a patient information sheet about the study which gives you all the information. So what's involved, what are the risks and benefits and what kind of things do you need to consider? You've got time to have those questions answered and then you go through an informed consent process. Um, the level of your involvement depends completely on the type of trial. As Flo mentioned, the drug studies, which this is an example of, are the most involved types of research, whereas some might just be taking part in some questionnaires, perhaps giving permission for your clinical information to be gathered as part of a registry study which can further information. So it totally depends. Not every trial is the same. Um, each uh, study has a specific trial protocol, which is all set out at the start. Um, what we try to do for you, if you agree to take part, um, so for example, some of our drugs at the moment take around six months, so we'll tell you at the beginning, these are what the visit set schedule is, you might need to come every week to begin with and then that will straighten out. So you might not drive in your lovely red car, but you'll come up to see us um, and we'll do a variety of uh, clinical tests, vital signs, relevant blood tests, have an ECG and an echocardiogram. Some trials involve other things such as a CPET, you might need a cardiopulmonary exercise test or to have a cardiac MRI as part of the study. All the results are then collated and we'll have clinical review by the primary investigator. Um, most trials collect patient reported outcomes, so using questionnaires we want to know about your quality of life, your symptoms and how things are faring for you as you go through the trial. Um, while you're with us, you would take the study medication. You might then need to have further tests, a blood test, just be observed for a period of time. Then the fun begins, we wait for the prescription, um, and then we'd arrange for you when your next um, follow-up would be. Um, your travel expenses are more, most often covered, and sometimes some expenses when you're here on the day as well. So in terms of getting involved in research, it is really important to ask if it, is, it, is it for me? Because it can be a positive experience, but understand that it's not for, not every trial is for everyone. It's always really important to say that if you decide not to take part in research, it doesn't inf affect your clinical care in any way. There's no prejudice. And similarly, if you think, yes, I do want to do this, and you sign up for a trial, and then you change your mind, you can do that at any time. There's no problem whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> but, so yeah, first of all, as Flo said, do speak to your own healthcare provider about specific trials that might be happening at your NHS organisation. That is often easier if there is travel involved and frequent visits. You can very welcome to have a look at the BARTS research website. 
Um, and we're here with our colleague from the National Institute of Health Research um, that covers England, which um, if you have a look at the Be a Part of Research website, that's got a list of all current actively recruiting trials, and we will add Heart Hive <laughs> onto here now as well. Um, so that's everything that we wanted to say. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And if you've got any more questions, do come um, and find us. We'd love <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Cardiomyopathy UK, for inviting Southampton Clinical Trials Unit to talk about our, our research today. My name is Anna, and I'm the trial manager at the Southampton Clinical Trials Unit. I came here today to talk to you about potentially groundbreaking research that is being conducted in the field of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, a trial called the British Study, which is funded by the British Heart Foundation. As many of you may already know, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy is a medical condition where the beating and pumping action of the heart is reduced even though the blood supply to the heart is completely normal. Research has shown that patients who also have an area of scarring of the heart as seen on cardiac MRI are at the higher risk of developing fast and potentially life-threatening electrical rhythm disturbances in the lower chambers of the heart. Current guidelines suggest that the doctors should consider an implantable loop, um, cardioverter defibrillator also known as the ICD, to correct these abnormal rhythms. It, uh, this device is implanted underneath the skin using a local anesthetic. It consists of a small battery-powered computer or a generator and fine flexible leads secured into the um, heart chambers. It can detect and correct dangerous heart rhythms by delivering a shock if required. However, a recently conducted study called Danish questions these current guidelines, prompting further research in this area. In the British trial, we aim to identify which patients truly benefit from having an ICD, aiming for more specific guidelines and for better patient and hospital outcomes. By taking part, people with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy have the potential to guide treatment for others with similar heart problems in the future. The British study is led by Dr. Andrew Flett, who is the heart failure consultant at the University Hospital Southampton. The British trial will test whether a presence of a scar tissue on the heart scan can be used to decide if the patient needs an ICD or not. And people who decide to take part in this trial will be allocated to a group that either receives an ICD or another group who does not. The groups are decided randomly by a computer and this process is called a process of randomization, which means that you have a 50-50 chance of being in either group, which allows a fair comparison between the groups. For those participants that are allocated to no ICD, we'd like to fit a device called an implantable loop recorder, also known as the ILR, which is a slim device that monitors the heart rhythm and is implanted underneath the skin under the local anesthetic in a procedure that takes approximately 10 minutes. For people who agree to take part, we would like to collect a blood sample which will be stored for future genetic testing. We will also collect information about their medical history and the heart function. Participants will also be asked to complete quality of life questionnaires to assess the, the, the health at the start and at the end of the study. All participants will be contacted at the three year time point post device implantation by telephone and we will collect information about their health from the health records of up to 10 years. We are currently working with 42 sites across the UK, of which 25 are currently open to recruitment. We've got further seven sites that are nearly ready to open to recruitment, and further 10 in setup stage. And if you wish to find out more about the British study, 
please visit our website where you can learn more about the journey of the first patient that was randomised for the study. You can also watch a video called Explain My Procedure, explaining the study in further detail. And you can also email us directly um, using the email address which you can see on the screen. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm just curious, with those that are randomised to have an ICD, is that a, an intravenous one or a subcutaneous? Uh, predominantly subcutaneous one. Thank you.